And thank you, President Steve. Ah, the theater. You know, I learned a lot during COVID. And one of the things I learned most is how much I missed gathering as a community, climbing into that little boat you call a theater with my friends and colleagues and casting off on an ocean of emotion, captained by actors making adventure happen. Well, our guest today is Jeffrey Herman. That's two R's in the middle, two N's at the end. Just like Nolman, two L's in the middle, two N's at the end. Jeff, you must be Irish. <laughs> well, I can't wait. Our guest today has been making it all happen as the Managing Director of Administration at the Seattle Rep since 2014. Before settling in West Seattle with his family, including Jack, his mighty miniature dachshund, he honed his skills with a multitude of leadership and teaching experiences from north, and I mean in, Alan, as in the last frontier, to the south, and from the east coast to the west coast. And during those moments, he learned how to create a performing arts vision that creates access and opportunity. His gifts in the performing arts will sometimes inform us, sometimes entertain us, sometimes educate us, but always, always, always enrich us about our humanity. I'm looking forward to this. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow Rotarians, please welcome Jeffrey Herman. There we go. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. It's great to be uh, in a crowd with like live people again, huh? <laughs> Amazing. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, as Tom said, I, I spent some time up in Juneau, Alaska, uh, running a small theater there. Uh, and I was, uh, for eight years, a member of the Juneau Downtown Rotary Club. Uh, I was sergeant at arms for a year. So um, I have a, a you know, deep love for, for Rotary and, and the work that you all do. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Uh, I was asked to come and talk a little bit about the rep, and hopefully this will be um, a bit of a, an analog as well for everything that a lot of my colleagues in the performing arts uh, community here in Seattle and around the country um, have been experiencing. Um, let me start, uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, let's start with um, first, uh, how many folks here have been to Seattle Rep? Just show of hands, okay, most of you. Fantastic, I like to, I like to see that. Um, for those of you who uh, are not familiar with the Rep, um, I just want to share a little bit of our history. We were founded in 1963 at Seattle Center for the World's Fair. Uh, our very first production was King Lear. Um, we are still here almost 60 years later. Um, at that time, originally, we performed in what is now the Cornish Playhouse. Uh, in 1983, we moved across the courtyard to what is now the Bagley Wright Theater. Uh, in 1990, the Rep was awarded a, a Tony Award for Outstanding Regional Theater, so that was a big moment for the organization. We built uh, our second stage, the Leo K, in 1995, so we currently operate two spaces uh, in our building at, at uh, Seattle Center. We built uh, an endowment fund, $15 million in, 20, in 2004, excuse me. Uh, and then I arrived in 2014. Some of you may uh, have known my predecessor, Ben Moore, who was the managing director at Seattle Rep for almost 30 years, been retired, and uh, the board found me. I was running a theater in Washington, D.C. Uh, my wife, who I met in Alaska, was very eager to get back to the Northwest, and I always promised her that if an opportunity ever opened up that would get us closer to Alaska, I would take it seriously. And so when Ben announced his retirement and I was contacted, I said, well, I'll you know, be a good husband, and I'll throw my hat in the ring. Um, and the more I learned about the opportunity, uh, the more I realized this was a, a great chance for me um, to, uh, to come to this incredible institution. Um, at the time, uh, I was going to partner with the artistic director, Jerry Manning. Um, uh, and just a little sidebar, um, uh, I'm the managing director. My partner at the theater, and this is the way most performing arts organizations are structured, is the artistic director. And we are co-equals running the theater together. The way I sort of describe it is that the managing director uh, manages the restaurant and the artistic director is the chef. Um, but we really do it together. We're co-equals and we report together to a board of directors. And my partner was going to be Jerry Manning. And three weeks after I said yes to the job and I was still in Washington, D.C., uh, Jerry passed away very unexpectedly. 
Uh, and his associate, a guy named Braden Abraham, was appointed interim. And we both started together on the same day, July 15th, 2014. So, you know, instant new leadership. Um, at the time, uh, we inherited an organization, you can see up here, about 8,000 subscribers, about 90,000 patrons each season. Our budget was about $9 million uh, today, or at least pre-pandemic. Um, 12,000 subscribers, 150,000 patrons each year, $15 million budget. So we've seen a lot of growth over the last six or seven years up until, up until COVID. Um, some of the signature shows at the Rep, obviously we had a long history with August Wilson, uh, did his entire American Century cycle uh, over probably a decade plus at the Rep. Um, more recently, um, we did the LBJ plays. These were two plays chronicling the presidency of, of LBJ. Uh, Come From Away, hope folks got to see this. Um, we look like geniuses now. At the time, a musical about 9-11 didn't sound like, uh, you know, such an exciting thing to, to want to produce, uh, but it's turned into a worldwide phenomenon with five productions running around the world, and, you know, we were able to world premiere it here at the Rep for our audiences. Uh, we did an immersive uh, musical about uh, Amelda Marcos called Here Lies Love, which was probably the biggest thing we've ever produced in the theater's history. Um, and uh, this public works program is something I'm very proud of. This is uh, a project where we partner with health and social service organizations across the city, uh, and we produce um, sort of a pageant style large musical every year with our community that can have upwards of 120 people on stage. And sort of that middle picture right there with all those bodies up on stage is uh, sort of a, a, our last public works production. Um, let's, go to the, let's go to the next slide. Um, so our, our growth at the Rep up until the uh, pandemic at least, uh, I think has really been charged by this model that Braden and I adopted when when we took over the rep in 2014. And it was sort of articulated by a guy named Michael Kaiser, who's a arts administration guru, ran the Kennedy Center in Washington, DC for many years. I'm a big believer in this model. Really starts at the top with astonishing art. You have to put astonishing things on your stage that make people want to turn off Netflix, get off the couch, fight traffic, and come down to Seattle Center. You have to support that with really aggressive marketing. You can't scrimp there. Um, you build your family, you ask that family for money, you take that money, you invest in it, even more astonishing art. And it becomes a virtuous cycle that moves the organization forward. Um, I think that the rep for a number of years in response, perfectly natural to the economic meltdown in 2009, had really started tightening the belts and tightening the belts. Most of the money goes to production and to marketing. It's natural to want to cut away there. I think that started a bit of a vicious cycle. Um, where you've got not so astonishing art and you're not really marketing it aggressively and you're not building your family of fewer people to ask for money and it becomes a bit of a vicious cycle. And so I think our success largely has been doubling down and saying we are going to invest in the art on stage. We're going to go big. That's what people want to see when they come to the rep. And I think that's what's really led to the growth of the organization, at least up until March of 2020. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, just real quick, our, our mission, vision, values. This is what we're dedicated to uh, every day at the rep. I'm, particularly proud of the vision statement. It took us three years to get that down to seven words. Um, but I really like it, theater at the heart of public life. That's really what we, we, we strive to be at the Rep every day. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about our, our finances. I am the, the business guy after all. And um, our auditor is uh, watching on Zoom, so she will be here to, she'll be here to check me, Sarah. If I say anything wrong here, uh, let's go to the next slide. So um, our, uh, our budget, uh, at least pre-COVID, uh, $15 million of revenue. Um, the way most performing arts organizations revenue picture is structured is you've got earned revenue, which would be ticket sales, classes, anything that you uh, provide a service for that you receive re remuneration for, and then uh, contributed revenue, which would be contributions from individuals, government, corporate. Um, you can see our split here is about 45% earned to 55% contributed. Um, big piece of our earned revenue picture, obviously ticket sales and subscriptions. Um, concessions, venue rentals, a little bit smaller. Um, royalties have become significant for us recently, largely because of Come From Away. We are getting checks off of all five of those productions around the world. That totaled about a million dollars the year before COVID shut down. So that's, that's real money, significant money. That's been a big help to us. Um, and on the contributed side, um, individuals really is where uh, the majority of our, of our support comes from. Um, this community, as you all know, is an incredibly supportive and philanthropic one, and that's certainly proven the case for the rep. Um, I should mention we were running uh, a campaign, which we were calling Act One of the Campaign for Seattle Rep, $15 million effort over three years um, that we were running in tandem to our operating budget 
uh, up until COVID. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so our expense picture, a little over $15 million of expenses before COVID. Um, you can see it really breaks down to um, show direct show expense that would include artist salaries, uh, carpenters, anybody related directly to a show as well as marketing. Uh, the rest of it is really overhead with sort of staff, facilities, <clears throat> departmental expense. Um, if you add up all of the money that goes to labor between show expense and staff payroll, it's about two thirds of our dollars go into the, people, uh, into the pockets of people. Performing arts are a very labor intensive industry. Um, it requires a lot of people to put on a show. That's the magic of it. It's one of the things I love about the theater. My professors in graduate school has always said theater is the most collaborative of the arts. Um, that makes it one of the most expensive of the arts, but is also what is, I think, so magical about it is about bringing people together, which is why this pandemic has been so devastating to places like The Rep and, and others of us in the performing arts. Let's go to the next slide. So um, when COVID-19 happened uh, back in March of 2020, seems like a million years ago, um, it really altered our income picture uh, significantly and immediately. So um, on the earned side, obviously, uh, we couldn't sell tickets anymore because there were no more shows. Um, and uh, the royalty stream that we were receiving from Come From Away was cut off immediately as all five productions closed around the world. So that was significant sort of crimp uh, on our earned revenue. On the contributed side, um, we paused the campaign that we were in so that we could really focus on sort of saving the organization and shoring up the annual fund. Um, our endowment, which we rely on each year, uh, you'll remember the stock market uh, dropped pretty precipitously uh, right after the shutdown. Uh, so the endowment lost a huge amount of value. It was not the right time to take money out of the endowment when that happened. So that avenue was sort of closed off to us. Um, corporations really cut off support as well at that time, uh, and the foundations really focused more on health and human services and homeless services and food services. So we had a lot of avenues sort of immediately cut off to us, and our lifeline really became individuals. Um, those folks in this community that have supported the rep for years and years really stepped up uh, and kept us healthy and strong at a really, really scary moment. Um, and I have to say the government support provided by the PPP loans was also critical at a really scary time for the rep and, and I know for a lot of businesses. And it was really those two things, individuals and that government support that allowed us to get through those first couple of months when it was really hard to see what cash flow was gonna be, if it was gonna be in uh, you know five, six months. Let's go to the next slide. How are we doing on time? Okay. Um, okay, so um, uh, given that uh, adjustment that we had to take uh, on the income side, we obviously had to make some adjustments on the expense side. And you can sort of see before uh, COVID, our burn rate was about 1.3 million a month, and we skinnied that down to about $400,000 a month. So we chopped our budget by about two thirds. You remember that figure I provided before where two thirds of our expenses goes into the pockets of people. And so that was largely on the back of, of employees, unfortunately. Um, and you can see the, uh, the stats up there. We let go of 50 artists that were engaged in the shows that we were hoping to end the season with, um, and a total of 93 administrative staff members, front of house staff, uh, and production staff. Um, at our lowest, we got down uh, to about 31, 32 people at the rep, which is a cut of about 70%. Um, so it was pretty devastating, but I know, you know, mirrors what a lot of folks had to go through to survive sort of that, that really scary time. And, Again, the great thing about performing arts is it is uh, very labor intensive. Uh, and so this really hit, um, this, this crisis has really hit our, you know, our labor pool um, terribly. Let's go to the next slide. So um, our results uh, last year and uh, the year that just ended on June 30th, uh, I'm pleased to say that we were able to, to end in the black uh, in both of those years. We were able to make it through. Uh, again, thanks to that contributed support that received that we received and sort of the savings that we uh, had to implement on the expense side. Um, it's funny, the, uh, the drop in ticket sales and royalties was really um, in some ways offset by uh, the, the drop in expenses from not actually producing shows. I was saying to my board, it's, it's amazing how much money you can save when you're actually not producing any theater. Um, and so that was one of the things that sort of helped us get through all of this. Um, again, the, the contributed support, government support was really critical. 
Um, again, I think these are really unique, unreplicable circumstances. So I don't know if this is, this is something that we can count on moving forward, but certainly got us through this really scary moment. And the big effort for the rep and for many of our colleagues in the performing arts right now um, is uh, pulling together the capital that we are all gonna need to reopen and to get the wheels rolling again. Um, we are a, a cash upfront industry. We put out money uh, to pay artists, um, to get rehearsals going, to build sets, to take out advertising. Uh, and the hope is that you recoup that money on the back end when the show's a huge hit uh, and people are going crazy looking for tickets. Um, and that money is what funds the startup costs for the next show and the next show. And that's sort of the cycle that sort of rolls us all through from season to season. Um, having stopped that for two years, I think the challenge for many of our organizations is going to be accumulating that capital we need to put out that money up front to be able to get the wheels of shows going again. Um, there was a lot of worry that we were gonna lose performing arts organizations right after the shutdown. And it turned out that, you know, um, stopping operations turned out to be relatively easy. Uh, I think what's gonna be a lot harder is restarting things. And that's where I'm worried we're gonna lose. We're gonna lose some organizations. Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so instead of just dwelling on all the bad things that happened, um, I, I thought it might be interesting and helpful to talk about some of the opportunities that have come out of this uh, circumstance and sort of the new opportunities that have presented themselves to the rep and to other performing arts organizations. Obviously, um, uh, we all, all of us, including the Rotary Club here, had to take a big step forward in terms of, of technology. We've all adapted to sort of this Zoom world. Uh, and that's certainly been the case in the performing arts. Um, while we have shied away from, you know, killing ourselves to produce like a fully virtual season, um, it was important to keep putting program out virtually during this period of time to make sure that we were connecting with and staying close to our supporters and friends. And so we were doing readings, workshops, panels, discussions, sort of, uh, you name it, like a, you know, huge menu of, of things that we were putting out there online. So we all became really adept at that work. Um, I think some of those um, some of those mediums really work well. Uh, I can imagine doing readings and workshops moving forward in this fashion. I can imagine doing more panels moving forward. I don't think that would have happened if we'd not been forced to do so as a result of the pandemic. So I think that's something that's really going to outlast this and is going to benefit us moving forward. Um, we developed a, a number of new partnerships. Right? Our goal is to impact uh, our community in a positive way. If we couldn't do that by putting work on our stage and welcoming folks through our doors, we had to find creative ways to do that. Uh, we worked with Providence to uh, build masks in our costume shop for that first month when there was a, a huge shortage. It was a great way to be able to employ our folks in the costume shop to do something really positive. Uh, we hosted a number of blood drives with uh, Bloodworks Northwest in our building, something we're still continuing to do. Uh, we did a, a, a drive for, uh, for farmer, farming families to deliver food and masks uh, out to rural areas of the state. So we're really looking for new opportunities to keep um, achieving our mission just in sort of a different way. And I think those partnerships would not have been formed without having gone through this experience. Um, we've made a huge uh, investment in artists um, during this period of time, though we couldn't uh, hire folks to come on our stage and perform for audiences. Um, we did everything we could to keep putting money into the pockets of our artists. And so um, uh, we did a number, as I said, we did a number of readings online. That was a way to get money to, to actors and to directors and to playwrights. Um, we just announced uh, probably the biggest play commissioning program in the theater's history, where we're commissioning 20 plays uh, by 2030, which are gonna be all about uh, sort of life in the 2020s. Um, and so those are significant paychecks that are going into these playwrights' pockets. They will result in new plays that we will hopefully be premiering for audiences over the next decade. Um, and uh, the New Directions program is a similar commissioning effort um, focused around directors, where we talk to directors and say, hey, we're gonna give you some money. Why don't you develop a project that uh, we can collaborate on together and present to our audiences. So we, we had to find some creative ways to keep putting money into the pockets of artists. Um, and I think these things are all gonna sort of flower and germinate over the next decade, hopefully to the benefit of, of our audiences and community. Um, and last but not least, uh, we took this time of closure um, to do a lot of work on our building. So this is deeply unsexy stuff, but when you've got uh, you know almost two years of nobody in the building, that's the time to take advantage of it. So we've completely revamped uh, our administrative offices, done a bunch of IT and finance stuff, um, dealt with our 60 years of archives, and most excitingly, um, we are uh, just in the process right now of renovating the public spaces of the theater. 
um, so that when folks come back to us next winter, they're going to walk into a new environment. So all new seats in the Bagley Wright Theater, um, remodeled restrooms, a new box office. I've actually got a couple of images if you want to go to the next slide. This is, uh, is what our new box office will look like. Next slide. Uh, this, is our, this is what our lobby will look like when this is all done in another year or two. And last slide, uh, the interior of the Bagley Wright Theater. Um, so some good, uh, hopefully, is coming out of this, which will set us up in good stead when we can finally bring people back into the building. Um, last slide. Um, so what's coming up next for us uh, at the Rep um, and for many of our colleagues? Well, right now we're in the process of, of restaffing and trying to rehire folks as we ramp up to what we anticipate to be our return to action, which will be in January 2022. I'm sure many of you are experiencing um, challenges with uh, rehiring folks. It definitely is a seller's market out there for labor. Um, so uh, it's, it's been a, a real challenge. But right now, that's what we're trying to do is restaff um, in preparation for a, a January 22 uh, return to in-person production. Um, we announced uh, just two weeks ago um, a six-show season, so a little bit smaller than what we normally would do that will run January through June. And then the hope is that the following year, we'll be back to sort of normal operations. Uh, and then um, we have uh, relaunched uh, our Act One uh, campaign for Seattle Rep um, with a slightly higher dollar amount. Um, some of that is going to support that facility work that I showed you the pictures for, as well as um, developing the capital, pulling the capital together that we need to, to get the wheels rolling again this year. So we upped it to 17.5 million. Um, just a last couple of comments about some changes that I see permanently in the field moving on from this. Um, Obviously, remote uh, and online access, I think, is going to be here to stay. Um, theater is an in-person medium. Uh, it only happens when you've got uh, actors on stage in real time and an audience out there in real time. But um, I think one of the things we found is that there is a desire and a market for folks to be able to access that remotely and virtually. Um, and that is, uh, that is a capability and a possibility that we are going to be adding permanently moving forward. I think you're going to see a lot of performing arts organizations adding that moving forward. Um, during this period of time, we obviously saw a um, big explosion in terms of um, social calls for social justice and racial equity. Um, this has really impacted the performing arts field significantly. Um, I think you're going to see big changes in many organizations in terms of audience and board and artists and staff uh, as a result of these calls. And last but not least, um, I think that coming out of this period of time, uh, we're going to be entering into a golden age of artistic production. Um, we know that uh, artistic work uh, often runs countercyclical to what's happening uh, sort of in our broader society, right? So when times are really good, that's when you've got those annoying artists saying, eh, but what about this? What about that? What about this? Um, and when times are bad, that's when you see um, exciting, joyous stuff coming out of artists. It really serves as a tonic to what's happening sort of in the broader current uh, of our culture. Um, and so I think coming out of this period of time, we're going to see something similar. Um, out of the Great Depression came some of the most joyous musicals that were ever developed. I think coming out of COVID, we're going to see um, joyous, communal, um, just life-affirming work, which is, I think, what we all need right now. That's certainly what we have programmed next season at The Rep, because um, I think that's what we need after being in our houses for two years. Um, so I'm really excited to see what uh, playwrights, what, what is going to come out of the minds of playwrights in response to this period of time. But I think it's going to be um, exciting and really move the field and our culture forward. Um, and that's, uh, that's all I got for you. And I'm, I'm happy, to, happy to answer any questions if, if you've got any for me. Jeffrey. Am I on? Yeah. Yeah, Jeffrey, uh, thank you again. Wonderful presentation. You know, uh, someone know you taught uh, arts administration at George Mason. Uh, when you look back at this, and you know, they talk about uh, growth and comfort cannot coexist. Well, needs to say, COVID gave us the discomfort. But as you're thinking about the classes you would teach, can you talk a little bit about the growth that perhaps has come out of this? Or is it too early, frankly, to to talk about growth. When you, uh, you mean economic growth or? Uh, growth in, in just in arts administration, how, you know, uh, everything we've gone through, <laughs> there are there positives that you've claimed out of this? Well, what I'm certainly seeing is, when I talk to my colleagues around the country is, um, is resilience. You know, you go through an experience like this um, and it teaches you what you are capable of, that you can make, you know, these really big, scary decisions 
um, and do what you have to do to make the organization survive. And um, having gone through that experience, I think is going to um, prepare arts administrators around the country for you know the other ups and downs that come with uh, running any not-for-profit organization, which is always you know sort of a, a risky endeavor at any time. Um, so I do think it's built some muscle um, and some resilience uh, for folks that are going to allow them to get through tough times moving forward, because it's hard to imagine a, a tougher time than this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had a question that was, what, what were your top ideas for aggressive marketing? What, what should you be doing with people that share how you promote? Yeah, I um, I think that um, well, look, we none of this is you know I think going to be a surprise. Um, we've gone through a, you know a huge transition at the rep from print medium to electronic. I mean, I think that's where that's where the game is sort of moving forward. Um, I think we've become a lot more um, a lot more attuned to sort of the visual identity of the organization, how important that is to sort of forming a, a position in the marketplace about about the theater, but also about the, uh, any of the particular plays. And I think the other thing um, that we've really tried to invest in at the Rep is, um, is institutional marketing versus you know, show to show to show to show. Um, I, I try to think of it more uh, like, a, like a sports team, um, that what you're marketing is the experience at the ballpark. It shouldn't matter whether the team wins or loses. I mean, obviously, it helps when they win. But um, that it's more about the ritual of coming being there with your friends, doing the seventh inning stretch, um, getting the hot dog, that, 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 that's what people remember. They don't necessarily remember whether the team won or lost. They remember being there with their family or their partner or their son or their spouse. Um, and that's what we're really trying to focus on when it comes to, to marketing the organization and why folks should want to come to the rep. Um, with that said, do you know what the six plays are that you're going to bring in? I do know what the six can plays are. Can you give us a short summary of them? I picking? can, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, um, so we're going to start uh, in January with a, a, a new play that we were going to do before the, the pandemic hit called Fanny, which is a, a musical written by Cheryl L. West, who is um, a local Seattle playwright, actually the most produced living playwright at the Rep. It's about Fanny Lou Hamer uh, and about uh, sort of her work uh, in civil rights. Um, so that's going to kick things off in January. We're going to bring in a show called Freestyle Love Supreme, which is produced by Lin-Manuel Miranda, who obviously wrote uh, Hamilton. This is sort of a, a freestyle kind of rap improvised musical. It's a, a raucous riot every night. I think it's going to be um, a blast, really fun, high energy. Um, we're going to be doing a production of Ghosts, so a classic play by Strindberg. Uh, and then uh, the last play in the big theater, um, is the one I'm most excited about. It's a, a new musical called Bruce. Um, and this is about the making of the movie Jaws, um, which was famously a, a, disa like a disastrous shoot. Like everything that went wrong, like went ro could have gone wrong, like went wrong on that shoot, including the mechanical shark, which kept breaking down, which they nicknamed Bruce. Um, and so it's, it's all about uh, sort of seeing your artistic vision through and improvising through um, all the things that kind of go wrong. Um, to sort of produce this this sort of success, Steven Spielberg is the main character and sings all through the musical, and it's uh, it's really going to be a blast. We did a workshop of it uh, about two weeks before the the shutdown, and um, there are commercial producers involved that could move on to Broadway. So that's that's the one I'm I'm really excited about. Yeah, so it should be should be really fun. I'm looking forward to it. All right, we have time for one more question. Uh, okay, so we got um, we got 1.7 uh, the first PPP round and another 1.7 the second PPP round. Um, was it easy dealing with the government? <laughs> um, well, we dealt. Fortunately, we dealt with our bank, um, and they were wonderful. There were a lot of problems uh, at first when they were first uh, sort of rolling this program out. So there were delays, but um, we ultimately got uh, we got the support that we needed, and it came just in time. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everybody. Jeff, before we lose you entirely, uh, just uh, thank you for a really, uh, really interesting and thought-provoking and uh, uh, for a presentation that gives us something to look forward to. Uh, in your honor, we have donated 1,500 pounds of fresh food to Harvest Against Hunger, uh, which will provide that food to local food banks and also just a Bellevue Rotary mug for 
uh, you remember us, remember us by. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.